Read the manual before use. Informati su nostro auto revolver Matiba seis unica. Yeah, that 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 did me a lot of good. Um, I put this gun back together again, and there's a recoil spring and a guide rod missing from it, and it's a little flaccid. Um, let's get on a rabbit hole and find out how to take this thing apart and put all the parts back in it. Here we go. So why are we really here? We're really here because there are some issues with this gun and the report was, was that as the cylinder came around and it came forward, it wasn't locking in place. The frame comes back under recoil and then the cylinder indexes. Okay, well, all this whole, there's a lot of, there's more slop in this thing than a World War I 1911. Um, and it's because the owner of this particular piece of equipment uses it, runs it, and just absolutely enjoys the heck out of it. And isn't that what you're supposed to do? So we want to fix this slop. I also want to go after this hardware store screw, which the owner admits to having put there. So we're going to get rid of that. Um, and then the last thing that his complaint was, was that this aftermarket muzzle brake doesn't time up. It's not coming all the way around so we're going to make this thing time up so that when it screws in it's just slightly pointing to the left to control muzzle flip uh you know and having said that i think we'll go up and down because if i'm not wrong the owner of this thing is left-handed normal manual of affairs says you let the hammer down pop this lever and that will come open and then there's a locking stud in here that right there sticks out right there and that's what is retracted when you cycle the action that's pulled back and then when you drop see that stud can come and go and this this whole thing is just lost its manual index so we'll take it apart here and uh, see what we can come up with on the inside and yes when we put it back together again i'm fully well aware of the fact that the recoil spring and the follower has got to go in from what i've read and I'm gonna tell you, I've never actually held one of these things in my hand. So you're about to watch me take it apart for the first time. There's a set screw located in this hole somewhere. Okay, so that's a hex wrench right there that is plugged in and is allowing me to remove what I think is going to be a set screw. Again, you can't see through my fingers. You just gotta trust me that I'm doing it. And in fact, I think I'm actually going to have to cock this to get the to, uh, get the trigger out of the way. Wow, check that noise out. Yeah, I'm actually going to have to cock it. Well, I don't know. There we go. That gets that out of the way. And then we'll get that set screw to follow it. Okay, so there it is. It's a set screw with that wrench that pulls it out. And then... The, it separates into two groups. It separates into the lower and the upper half here. And we're gonna stay out of the lower half for right now, but eventually we will remove the grip and go in and clean this thing, because that was the other thing I was asked to do was to give it a detailed cleaning. I, however, think our issue is in the upper here, so I'm gonna grab a wrench and break that loose. And I'm sure there's a dedicated tool for this. I'm just going to be really, really cautious with this. And spin this off. So to give you some idea of what's going on up in here, he also sent a lot longer barrel with it, but doesn't have the housing for it. So what we're doing right now is we're running these threads out of the inside of the receiver. But these, uh, well, that's kind of, wow. Man, this thing is dirty. Woo! Okay, so all I'm doing is threading this off without having the wrench near it. So I guess what will happen is, is it's just going to be easier if I do this. I'm trying to keep from hitting this anodized aluminum finish, which wouldn't do a lot of good. So this housing here is held on between this taper 
And up inside this, there's a ring that keeps the, the, um, that keeps the distance from the back end of the cylinder right there from touch the from front of the cylinder from touching the back end of the barrel. Uh, head spacing revolver is the same whether or not the revolver is cocked automatically or you have to cock it with your index finger, one or the other. Let's finish pulling K. So that came out. This came out. Now to set the distance from where this stops to where the cylinder barrel gap occurs. Now it happens down here, but I can't show it to you. In order to set that distance, there's a ring in here. Now I know all this because if you think I'm working this blind, you're wrong. Um, I have a, it's Italian, but thank God Bruno has got a little bit of Italian in him. So we're looking at part number uh, 79 right here. It doesn't show up really well, but all the parts are apparently identifiable. I did a little bit of looking and uh, optical character readers are awesome. But the problem is, is that it gives you a very, OCR readers are very literal and they don't give you the nuance of the language. Anyway, we got the barrel out, locking block, little gizmo here. That's the head spacing ring, so we'll set that over here. All right, so now we're down to what's messed up in this thing, I think, barrel shroud. This unlocks by moving this lever right here down. It's ambidextrous. You push down on this lever and kick that cylinder out. And I'm looking at some things here now. I'm looking up at the inside of this. We'll give you a, a, an up close on this here in a moment. We'll get it up on a vise because that's what we're going to have to do. There's a disassembly plate up here on the top. And uh, this is the base pin that it locks into. And let's check this out here. I got to reach in front of the camera and grab a screwdriver. So just like a regular revolver, we have the star here. And then we have this pin in the center that's used for the ejector. And then holy crap look at that okay so wow i'll bet you we could even pick that up this far away bruno i'm gonna run up tight go ahead and give me a, a give me give me a refocus here if it'll let you get in that tight it may not here we go oh wow okay so that entire bushing i don't know if it's loose i have to make a tool to um check the tightness of this it might be screwed up it might be something but all this slop will definitely translate to slop here let me see if i can really let you see that wow look at all that movement that shouldn't be there now the slop between the sliding part of the frame that looks awful lot like a 1911 set of slides right there that i'm okay with because everything's moving with that, and as long as it moves the same way, and it's a semi-automatic revolver. What the hell do you think? You were going to hit something with it? The cylinder has to come off towards us. And there's a plate here that's a permanent part of most revolvers, and in this particular case, it's not. So again, here, I will grab this out of the way and keep my fingers out. We'll remove that. All of the fasteners on this gun, as you might have expected for something made in the 1980s, are metric. All right, let's see what it's going to take to persuade that to come off. Is that okay? So that plate right there, the pin sticks down inside that hole that's right there on the top of my thumb, and that keeps the cylinder from coming out to the rear, or at least it appears to. So if we fold this out, this should kick to the rear and it looks like it's going to now i'm encountering some resistance and what i'm checking for are bolts i'm just going to pull it out and then we'll talk about it when i get it out okay so that slid free um, this is the pivot that the crane pivots on inside the gun and then this is the crane and then the cylinder assembly so i'm going to set the frame down and we're going to look at this problem right here. So I'm detecting a few things right off the bat. 
all of this is loose. This has got a lot of slop in it and the guide rod, the guide rod in the back, let me see if I can demonstrate the run out on it. You see it going up and down? Um, in this particular gun, it doesn't lock up on that rod, but Anytime this rod is is not uh, is concentric is what's the word eccentric is the word I'm looking for. Anytime it's nubbing around like that, that's not good. So we'll probably go in and deal with that. We also note that this thing was so loose, I was able to pop it off with my fingers. That's a little bit too loose. You don't want to gorilla these threads because I'm going to tell you what those are some awfully small, very very fine threads right there. Let me get my fingernail behind that. Those threads right there will strip on a moment's notice. However, so I don't know what we're going to do there. I'm going to put a little bit of blue Loctite on that. We're going to do something in order to jam that up. We might actually confine this right here just a little bit. We may take a tubing cutter and just make a very, very slight line and give that a little bit of drag. Okay, that comes off. That came off, and now we're left with this strut. There's a flat spot on it. Here again, there's a flat spot right there. I don't know, yeah, there it is, it's shining. That flat spot is what keeps this thing from rotating and it's been beat up pretty well up at the front, beat up pretty well up at the back. But now what I'm looking at here, we can get rid of that. Let's see here, let me get that kind of up in the middle so y'all can see it. Now these are aluminum jaws and I did not just trap the screw threads in a bunch of steel and screw them up. Right there, there we go. So the real issue is, how do we turn this particular fastener without boogering it up? We don't know if it's been staked. We don't know if it's been loctited. We don't know anything. Again, we're used to looking at revolvers. Again, I'm gonna tell you, while this is a pretty funky combination of technologies, there's nothing I see in this revolver that isn't just standard gunsmith. And I mean, the Italians make some pretty sexy stuff, but wow. And this is no exception, um, but in this case, uh, while it may look uh, while it may look good, they didn't really deviate off the beaten path. So my guess is, is that that's a threaded stud. So now we need to make a, a spanner that'll go across that. Well, this is a broken, an old broken screwdriver tip, and this is why you keep these things. We're going to make a spanner here that's going to fit across that.
right there. We will take our tool now and I'm going to come in here and I, th I don't know whether or not this thing is loose or messed up and we'll try to, it, you know, loose, unloosen it here. Okay, you know what we just found out? That's a left hand thread. Look at that. I'm turning that clockwise and that bad boy's backing out. Now, there has got to be a spring in here. I can feel it clicking, but the fact that I can do this with my fingers means this was a bit loose. So let's just get this all the way up to the top here. All right. Oh my. So there's some corrosion down in there. I don't know if that's showing up particularly well, but that screw has got this orange glock all over it and it's just it's not good but this plunger here is what's supposed to snap up inside the receiver housing and hold it shut and that plunger is all this gun locks closed on so uh, I'll get this cleaned and uh, we'll look at some other facets of this cylinder all right this has got the accumulated mung all over it. It's not showing really well here, but there's just, well, here, well, here we go. That'll prove it right there. That's just, yeah. Okay. So there's rust up inside this hole here, which I don't know if I can get you, let you see that. Um, the places on this gun that were supposed to be maintenance or could be maintenance have been. So we're just going to call this it's 200,000 round checkup. And if you think I'm exaggerating, this boy shoots his stuff, I'm gonna tell you what. So this is tight. Nothing here is loose inside the crane. Um, as I've covered on previous videos, don't snap these guns shut um, because you'll bend this assemblage right here. I don't want you to do that. Cylinder looks good, no scoring. Nothing up inside the chambers. We can see the chambers here are clean and unscored. You can catch an, um, uh, catching reflections in them. These holes right here are where that stud pops into to lock the gun. So when you're locking that cylinder in on the bottom, that's the hole the locking block is in. So you're off by 90 degrees. Not bad. Nothing wrong here. And thank God, because you think something's made out of unobtainium, I'm holding you an entire ingot of unobtainium. I have it all laid out here. Now I've cleaned all the dirt off of it. We have the left-handed thread uh, tightening stud that we went ahead and made the tool for. This is the stud that the entire lock, gun lock shut on. Spring-loaded plunger that fits up inside. That and that goes up inside. This is the, uh, the spring that allows you to do the ejection and then that's the cap that sits on that. And all of that fits up inside of the cylinder and then all that's then mounted on the crane here like this so I've cleaned all this up now and you can see it's free to move and well that's just excellent all right so let's get into the upper on this thing and take a look at the part that um, locks the gun shot and contains the firing pin so we're in the upper here and these two screws are removed revealing the firing pin here there's the firing pin I'm trying to work 90 degrees here so the firing pin sticks through the back end of this plate, okay? Yeah, that's good right there like that. And then the firing pin return spring is right there. So that, that's the firing pin right there. So I'm going to pull this whole thing out. Firing pin, firing pin spring. And then, like I said, this plate was held in by those two screws there, and that's going to be set aside because... Everything in this gun has got this accumulation among it from a long time ago. This gentleman runs his equipment. There is a not so fine line between hard use and abuse. And this gun is by no means over the abuse line. And that's not what I'm trying to tell you here. It's used hard um, and now he wants it maintenance. I'm golden. These two levers here, when they're popped up, retract. This is the locking screw right here, so you can see this moving in and out. So that's what that locking pin from the cylinder was pushing in on on this side. So when the gun comes shut, that is locked that way. And I'm trying to show the screwdriver moving, but I don't think I can get a very good look at it. All right. There's another thing that's going on in here, which is this spring. 
a slight reposition here allows me to show you this spring. There's a spring right there. And when that spring has tension on it, it will allow you to, it's gonna be difficult to prove this. See how that tends to wanna pop up? So I'm gonna put my finger on this spring and I'm gonna hold it down and we're gonna watch this handle right here. There you go. It doesn't wanna do that. All this is held collapsed by that back plate. There we go. So when that spring has actually got tension on it, this wants to pop up, you see? So without that tension, that doesn't wanna pop up. So that spring is compressed and held in by the back plate. And then the other thing that's going on is that this is the hand. And this right here is what actually advances the cylinder. So when we put the gun together, it's gonna to be important that we have this kicked out. So for the other side of that, we can see that, let me get in here, right there. You see the hand moving up and down? Right there. So that's what's causing the cylinder to advance, right there. Um, not the easiest thing in the world to just take apart. There is a, let me get back into the focus realm here. This center pin, like I said before, is pushing in and I don't know all of the inner relationships here. There's a very, very, very small Jesus clip right here holding this on. And I'm not trying to be irreverent, uh, irreverent to the Lord, but if that thing pops off, only God knows where the hell it came down. I'm only doing this because I wanna show something that I don't think has ever been done before. I don't, I don't know, we looked all over the place. Maybe I didn't look in the right places, but I can't find any pictures of this gun without its clothes on. Beginning gunsmiths. I've been doing this for 40 something years and every grain of my being is going, stop, run away, because I'm going deeper into this gun than I should go. But I wanna go in and show everybody how it works and it's filthy all the way down inside. Okay, well, this particular cross draw bar has a thin drive part on it that fits inside this. So this right there, that's the piece that slides in and out. That it, so when you push in on the lock, this is the part that's pushing in on you like that. So that's how the whole gun locks shut. And then this and this, these little thing, thingamaboppers here are related. They have an Allen set screw inside each one of them that allows you to tighten them down on those two holes. So that's the locking bar so far. I've got the fire control group in there. So now I'm looking at, there is a spring driven doohickey in here and I don't know what all this is. I'm gonna have to look, but you can see how that's spring loaded. So we have to be careful that we don't just pop that out. There is a screw sticking through the side of this action and pardon my fingers but this screw right here, as this comes out, this screw is what is holding the device that drives the lock. So here we go. The lock for the cylinder is right here and there it goes coming out, you see? So this is the part that swings and sets the timing. Now I have photographed this so I know how to get back in here. But that bad boy comes out of there and I'm sure that once I get it in a place, it'll just slide out, hold on. Let me make this come out, here we go. Again, there's a lot of, a lot of yak down in there, I'm sorry. So the way that was sitting in the gun, that bar is driving this um, in and out in a swinging motion with this spring propelling it. We'll get an uptight photograph of all this later. I'm gonna lay all this stuff out and let you guys see all these parts. But this is the piece right here as it swings back and forth through an arc that's driving this pin in and out. And this piece right here is what locks into the hole in the back of the cylinder. So that locks right there. So there's your locking mechanism. That's to lock the cylinder. This is to lock the cylinder shot. Two different things going on here. 
the rest of this is going to be the aforementioned little uh, little rings here that are holding this on and I haven't decided how I want to service that problem yet. Sometimes you can just drive this straight through like on a standard uh, a standard automatic rifle from the 1920s. Sometimes these have to be popped off. I haven't figured out how I want to deal with that yet so that I can take this shaft out right here and that shaft then allows this spring-loaded part and all of this. There's the hand. It's the entire thing that operates the hand. All of that has to come and go. I don't know if you can see that up in there. There's a part there that's swinging back and forth. So all of this makes sense. I'm just not in a magnificently huge hurry to just go bonsaiing it apart. We'll be back. I'll let you know how it came apart. Mark, you're all kinds of experienced. Yeah, I'm really experienced at popping little itty bitty rings off. Well, you know, who's, who's eating who for lunch, right? Anyway, you take that out of there in a plastic bag, and I succeeded in getting that, and we'll be right back, and I'll show you what it looks like. This particular piece picks the motion up, and just remember this, I'm going to show you that from this stud right here. So that, when that's mounted in the gun, that will actually be upside down like that. We'll get over to that later. But when that's mounted in the gun, this strokes up and down. This, this spring-loaded part right here that's the hand, so that stroke in the cylinder, all this is hung off of this cross rod. So as this moves, this torque tube brings the you have torque over to this. So these things are sitting up in there like this. And that torque tube, I'm sorry, like that. And that torque tube, when this is moved by the frame of the gun, that torque tube carries this over, moves this piece back and forth. That interacts with the previously mentioned bolt. Uh, let's see, let me go in this way. That way. And drives that up and down. Trust me, it is a complex little bugger. It's starting to make sense to me though, and I'm gonna try to do a, a, a serviceable job of explaining this to you guys. So that's it, we've got the frame stripped. Um, there you go, let's get a look up inside there. There it is, the frame stripped, all the parts are out of it. And uh, I guess we're gonna start working on the lower now. There are three rather gargantuan springs in this thing. The main spring sitting up inside the, um, the hammer. There's a spring right there. That's the trigger spring. And it also pushes up on the disconnector. That's the disconnector. And then up inside here, let's see if we can get a look at it, right there. There's the sear spring right there. You can see it coiled up, and that's actually the sear. So when this thing operates, that's the sear surface right there. Here, let me get a little better light on this. There we go. So when this thing is brought back to full cock, the sear will snap in. Now you can pull the trigger and this transfer bar right here is going to move the load from that pivot down through here and down to the bottom of the sear and when you step on this that's going to push the sear out of contact and allow the hammer to fall. Now as the slide comes to the rear this device right here is going to get pushed down on it and when it pushes down it kicks the sear loose so that with your finger still on the trigger the hammer is allowed to come back to full cock and then we can come back through and recycle. Bang. And it's, it's since it's semi-auto, it hangs back. Now, if you come all the way down, it'll actually let you do this double action. Yeah. So, how do you even think about taking this thing apart? Well, I'm going to tell you, the first thing I try to do is get all the weight off of all the springs. So we'll pop this cassette out, and I'm going to pardon my fingers, but I want to trap that, and I don't want to go chasing that across the room. So there is this, the main spring. Springs very rarely, if ever, work without something on the other end of them. So you've got this deal right here, a screw on the top and a plunger on the bottom. That's pretty standard. The next spring I want to get off this weight-wise 
is this guy right here. And the way I'm going to go after that, i got to get the light better here. On the side of the disconnector, hang on a minute, this light's fighting me. Let me see, right there. On the side of the disconnector, there's a stud sticking out. So in this particular case, we want to shove down on this, bring it over, and that's going to snap that spring out of the way. Now that gets rid of a lot of the weight. There are a lot of things not moving around in here. So that spring, you got to remember when you're putting things back in, springs never get bigger. They always get smaller. So when you want to figure out which way the spring goes on a shaft, it's got to wind up. It does not unwind. So the spring never gets bigger. It always gets smaller. Uh, let's see down here. I think that sear spring in there is going to take care of itself when we get down. The real question becomes is, my God, there's a lot of pins here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six pins in this thing. And what do they all do? And you don't want to just shake this thing out and rattle it out. Again, I'm going to tell you that this is my first trip down inside one of these. So I don't really know. Well, this transfer bar here appears to be an independent unit. It does appear to be an independent unit. And I'm willing to bet that we might be able to drive or we'll see whether or not that's actually able to be moved. So I'm going to get a Delrin bench block here. Because unlike that upper that's made out of steel, this uh, lower is made out of aluminum. And God, I don't want to mess this up. So I put the drive punch down through it. We'll retrieve our pin and now I have the capacity to just pull this out and make sure nothing explodes you laugh I'm not laughing so there we go now the spring came out you see and this entire mechanism probably comes out the top and I honestly swear to God I have not taken this apart before so this whole thing comes out the top and you can see the mung loading on it. There's a lot of, lot of Glock all over the inside of this thing. But there is one thing I want to point out while we're here. And let me get this up here in high relief. There's a screw sticking out. Yeah, that ain't in relief. There it is. There's a screw sticking out right there. And that's the over travel screw. And that over travel screw is supposed to run into the frame right here and you can actually see that that white spot where that stud has actually spalled that out and this gun's got a lot of over travel and that might make it hard to shoot accurately hmm. okay so we're going to set this off to one side no need to take this any further apart and just clean it the way it is and we'll set it off and let all that go together so what else have we got here well the hammer Looks like it's its own independent unit. Oh great, that just fell out the top. So we're going to look at the parts diagram and find out what that is. What is that? I don't know. So let's try to identify that on the parts diagram. That uh, looks a lot like number six. There's that gizmo right there. And number six is a... Well, that's a distributore, or whatever that is. Distributore. That's a distributor. Hmm. Distributor to me sounds like a rotating gizmo that moves force from one place to the other. Yeah, we'll figure that out when we get up in there. I didn't mean for that to just fall out. But it fell out because it was mounted on that pin. Ah, look at that. There's a pin there, you see. So this was mounted on a pin. And that pin just fell out through the frame. Outstanding. This piece here is independent. And the hammer is independent. So it's a hammer sear and this part. So this thing isn't as complicated as it looks. It's far, far worse. So when you drive out the pin, leave that in until you're ready to control the release of the energy. And we'll see here what that's interrelated to. Okay, so this part is also captured on this pin right here. At least that's what it looks like. 
which is the sear pin. So yeah, maybe it is that complicated. Hmm. Fascinating. Let me see here which pin I'm pretty sure it's captured by. This guy right here. So we'll drive that out. This whole thing will fall apart. Now all these pins appear to be the same size. Um, you'll note that the wear patterns on these pins are different. So these pins are leaving you clues as to where they're supposed to go by where the wear is on them. I don't think it's going to matter. This isn't a V8. We're not taking lifters out, I think. But there's some spring tension on this. I'm going to pull this pin out right now, and there is definitely some spring tension on that because that's a sub-diameter pin. So when I pull this out, something's going to pop, and I think it's going to be the sear. I'm going to put my finger right there, and I'm just going to let it pop up. And it was the sear, and that wasn't the right pin. That was the right pin. Okay, so that's the pin that's hanging on at this bad boy right here. Yeah, there it goes. We're loose. Okay. Guys, I'm sorry my hands are in the way. I just trying to get out of this thing in a way that I stand a fighting chance of getting back into it again. Okay. And we'll just push that the rest of the way out. That's still trapped. We lift this up. And all of that comes out in one great big piece. I'm trying to make this so it's easier to see. This pin was in there. So that was sliding up and down inside that slot around the trigger pin. It all makes sense once you see it. And then the only thing that's left in here is the actual sear. And this is spring loaded this way. See how it's spring loaded? So that will hold the back end of that up against the top of the hammer. And what the hell, we'll just push it out to another identical pin. And there's the sear right there. So that's it. We'll line all this up in one place so that you can see it all. All right, I've got all this stacked up outside of the gun here, and I'm going to try to peel this back for you. So first thing I want to show you, this silver streak right here, this is where the disconnector rides. That hump rides right in here. You see that hump sticking up out of the right side of a Browning High Power. You see it sticking up out of those little 22 automatics. Same deal. There's nothing all that really catchy here. But this is where the thing gets different. This is called a transfer plate or transfer bar or something. But the deal is all the energy comes into this system through this lever right here. So as the back end of the, as the top part of the gun takes off, this whole lever is rocked to the rear and supplies all of the energy to cock this hammer or it allows the trigger to do a double action pull. So this is the key piece to the whole deal. The energy comes in from the outside through this particular lever here. And this whole thing, you're just gonna have to trust me, man, it works. Maybe we can one of these days talk Bruno into making a, a, an animation of it. Well, there it is. That's a Matiba Unica in all its glory spread out on the table. And here's the sad part about all this. I still haven't done the refurb yet. So we've done all of this work, got this gun scrupulously clean and I've got it clean now. I've still got to put it back together again and then find out whether or not I fixed anything that was broken in the first flip in place. There's still a screw to make. There's a lot of stuff to do. Let me get this thing back together again and we'll see if it goes bang. Hey, I wanted to add something to this video real quick here. This is a standard revolver, Smith & Wesson Mark I Mod Zero. It's single action or double action. You, you, the hammer must be down to open it. If the hammer is cocked, you cannot open it, okay? Pretty much boilerplate stuff. This Matiba looks the same, but it's not. You can close it and open it when the hammer is down. You cannot open it when the hammer is back. So, so far, these are the same. But there's a couple of key differences. You can snap this handle back up, pop that cylinder latch pin back out, attempt to close this, and pretty you can screw this thing up pretty good. The thing that will really surprise you, though, is that when you pull the trigger, 
double action on his revolver, the trigger returns forward and it must be doubled again or you must cock it. Here is where you're gonna get into trouble. You pull the trigger on this gun, the gun comes to the rear and comes forward, the trigger stays back. You're reaching out thinking you're gonna go for another double action pull and the thing goes off on you. So you just have to learn your weapon system on any gun, rehearse it a little bit. Talk yourself through it, go by the numbers. I shoot so infrequently, the range is a special case for me. The shop is the normal case, and I'm handling these things like they are. They're just chunks of metal. But when I get to the range, I've gotta think through my manual of arms for a little bit till I get back acclimated to operating. It's because I don't shoot much. If you don't shoot much and you're an accountant, you need to double think that. And I'm not putting down accountants, but what I'm saying is, is that in my line of work, you would think that I'm proficient at this. And sometimes I'm not. Qualification and proficiency are two different things. And it's just a little public service announcement. No, you are gone before you operate it or God forbid, carry it or worse. And I hope this never happens to you. You have to use it for real. All right, thanks a lot. Something eminently satisfying. Matiba Unica 6. Nice piece of kit. And as always, it's been a pleasure to demonstrate some really interesting stuff to you guys. Thanks again, and uh, we'll see you on the flip side.